Welcome, Adam. I'm so excited to talk to you about something that I really is close to my heart. First of all, you talk about a lot about the mind and how the mind is influencing our decisions about what we eat. But the biggest thing that you are talking about in your latest book is that the diet culture is crazy. <laughs> if I summarize yes. it, and that people, people, like me, the title of your book, you can't screw this up. And in this book, you talk all about how we've got to be so careful of the diet industry and how it's really messed people up and create a lot of the problems. And, you know, you talk about that. So I'm really pleased to have you on my show today to dive into this topic. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Absolute pleasure having you here. Adam, tell us about yourself first. Tell, tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, I think it has been an interesting journey. So I originally started on the research side of things, probably no different than you. So I was a researcher, but in psychology. So I cut my teeth in social psychology and also on the human physiology star, uh, side of things. So I was interested in the mind and the body. But life took me in interesting directions, and I wanted to have a bigger audience than the classroom itself. I ended up being the fitness and nutrition editor for Men's Health for a long time when when magazines were a big thing. So back in the, in the early 2000s, and that kind of led me on a very interesting journey over the last 20 years now of really getting to see health and fitness from a wide variety of perspectives, whether it was writing content that people would read or, you know, filming videos or doing audio. And then over the last decade plus, I've just been helping a wide variety of individuals, some of them very famous, whether it's the LeBron Jameses or Arnold Schwarzeneggers or Cindy Crawfords of the world, or whether it's individuals like moms and dads who are just trying to figure out how to become healthy. And I've written many books, but I, I took a pause from writing books almost a decade ago because I fundamentally became frustrated with a very, very simple question, which is, why is it that the more books on nutrition and diet and fitness we create, the more we become unhealthy, right? There is no shortage of diet books. There are no shortage of diets. But if you look even from an epidemiology standpoint, in the 1950s, when obesity and overweight was around 10% of the population in the United States alone, and this is now a global issue, right? You had about 7% of men dieting and 14% of women. Today, approximately 40% of men and 65% of women do multiple diets per year. And in the United States alone, 75% of the country is either overweight or obese, and worldwide, overweight and obesity rates have increased in every country for the last three decades. And it just became, well, you can't point the finger at one thing, right? Mm -mm, it's always a multitude uh, of factors, right. yeah. Health is complex. There is no magic bullet here. I find it troubling and concerning that we have more access to information and more diets than ever, and yet we're becoming more unhealthy. And that was the inspiration. It was a nine-year journey writing this book, trying to solve that question, which is, you know, why is it that all these diet books appear to be doing far more harm than good? Oh, I love that. I, it, it reflects back on so many aspects. You know, this last 30, 40 years, there's been so many changes in so many areas, as you say, with the how we eat. But another right. area is also how we manage our mental health. So with your psychology background, you've seen this too. And the right. shift happened around 30, 40 years ago. And so not only are people unhealthier physically, but they're unhealthier mentally as well. And there's an increase in self-help books, a diet and exercise books, yet everything's gone down. Plus there's an increase in the biomedical model where people are diagnosed, labeled, and medicated more. So you put all those sort of almost mechanistic neuroreductionistic type things together and you land up with such an you know the current issue that we have so i you know i love that you've explored it from this angle because this is the angle that i from the mental mind side I, I look at as well so this is really great one of the things i mean you talk about so much stuff you talk about taking a deep dive into the science of self-perception and i thought that's a great place to start because you just the way that you sort of laid the foundation and the comment i made about how things have changed over the last 30, 40 years. And we, we've changed how we look at ourselves. 
You know, we've, we've become so neuroreductionistic, so focused on the physical that we've forgotten all about the mind. And you emphasize quite often throughout your book, which I really was so thrilled to see, about the fact that, you know, if your mind's not right in this, I'm paraphrasing, but the essence of what you were saying, if your mind's not right, that really does influence how you manage your, you know, your eating habits and your, men- your physical health as well as your mental health. And the self-perception concept, I really love that. And you talk about how if we change our thoughts about ourselves and eating and all that kind of stuff, releasing mental baggage and so on, it's actually so much easier to eat in a different way. So I'd love to talk about that a little bit. And then I'd also, before we dive into that, though, I, I really am fascinated with your title. You can't screw this up. So before we dive into self-perception and mind and eating, Tell me about this title because you started telling me before we started. And I thought, no, 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 I want to share this with the audience. Yeah. So it, you can't so screw this up. <laughs> the the title was probably the last thing I figured out. So the the long end of the story is, you know, diet books are usually built around a catch, something that like, what's the hook that gets people that want to, the, to get people to buy? I didn't want a hook because that's part of the problem. Right. We get people to buy into the if you change one thing and one thing only, you're going to become healthier. And when that doesn't work, and it usually works for a short term, right? And then you see long term failure and frustration. A few different things happen. One, you believe that the restrictive, extreme approach is necessary to be healthier. So you live in this prison that is created by the wellness industry of if you only cut out carbs, if you only eat no sugar, if you only fast, if you only cut out all gluten, and there's always a And if you always take a million supplements, sorry to interrupt you, and if you take Take, these million, sorry. No, you're you're right. Take a million supplements. We associate health with having a cost and an extreme sacrifice. Now, I'm not saying change is always easy. It's not. But I am saying is that change, especially for your health, does not have to be painful. And the problem is that we have put people in a position where we associate health with extreme sacrifice and we associate health with like this on off switch that if we just change this one thing, it'll be all better. But changing that one switch requires perfection. And this is damaging our mindset. It's warping our belief of what it takes to be healthier, but it's also now setting a precedent in the book world of this is what sells because people keep on buying into the short term fix, long term failure that just breaks us more and more and more and leaves us worse off. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to tell people like you have to eat these certain foods, but that makes it harder to sell because it's not sexy, right? You you know this as a neuroscientist. The diet industry preys on the way that our brain works because we like novel. We like new. I talk about this in the book. FMRI studies show that when you see something new and different, our brains light up. We release dopamine. We think this is going to be the thing, even if it sounds crazy, as opposed to things that are familiar and boring don't grab our attention the same way because we think, how could that possibly work? So the wellness industry is wonderful. It's spinning up new, novel, bright, shiny objects that we will consume very easily and keep on consuming, just like the supplements. And that's the problem because when they keep you buying, the goal is to get you to buy. It's not to help you. I'm here to help people. And it was very frustrating. So I wanted to write a book, but it's hard when you don't have a hook. So initially, in order to sell the book, I was going to call it the takeout diet. And the reason is I do want people to be able to eat takeout for the simple reason that it is not practical or sustainable to expect people to never eat at restaurants again. Exactly. And yet every diet you go on acts like you don't live in the real world. They tell you you can't eat restaurants, you can't have the bread basket, you can't order the chips, you can never drink alcohol, you can never have dessert. And like that's, everyone talks about a diet as a lifestyle, but when do these people ever ask what people want their life to actually look like? And that's where we should start. What do you want your life to look like? And then let's reverse engineer and make it healthier. So I did want to teach people how to uh, eat takeout, but that was never going to be the focus of the book. That was to sell the book. But then what I wanted to name the book and what I originally titled it was The Comfort Zone, because I believe that our ability to create healthier habits depends not on abandoning 
our comfort zone, but learning how to expand it, which means doing some things that are new and challenging and also keeping somewhat as old and familiar. And this is based on the Yerkes dodson curve, which will look at like where we thrive as individuals. And if you can think of it as just a beautiful inverted U, on one end, on the x-axis, it's the amount of stress you're in, and the y-axis is your performance. If you have no stress and no discomfort at all, right, you're laying on the couch all the time, you never try to eat a vegetable, you don't try and change anything, you're obviously not going to change, right? There's no like easy button. At the same time, if you're on the other end, where you are always in stress, you are worried about everything you eat, you're frustrated that you don't have time to work out, and you're thinking about a hundred different things a hundred times a day, that's also not setting you up to be successful. So I was like, I want to teach people how to expand their comfort zone. But then something interesting happened. I put 500 people through this program. And even the people who were having the most success kept on telling me the same thing. I'm going to screw this up. I'm going to screw this up. I know I'm going to screw it up. And it was right there in front of me that one of the biggest barriers that stands in people's way, which is why we have to talk about the self-perception stuff, is this mental boundary where diets have taught us to expect a level of perfection, a level of adherence that is not realistic or possible. So you're just waiting for failure to come. And if that is the environment that we live in, failure is then inevitable. But more importantly, we teach ourselves to measure success by things that are ephemeral or short lasting. We become obsessed with the scale. We become obsessed with calories. We become obsessed with superfoods. And all of these things, while seemingly benign, just add more stress and don't allow us to focus on the core things, which is what we think of ourselves. Because what we think of ourselves plays such a key role in our ability to change our behaviors. And this is based on the simple concept of we believe, we think, that when we want to change, we just need to wait to become motivated. And if we become motivated, then we will take action. When we take action, we'll see change. And that's when I'll feel better about myself. And that's great in theory. But you know, the, the research on behavioral change shows something very, very different. And I'm glad you said you wanted to start here because I said, this is actually where everyone needs to start. When people want to start a diet, they're like, oh, what's my new workout program? What do I need to throw out of my pantry? What do I need to buy at the grocery store? And I'm like, all those things will be helpful. But the most important thing is you need to change your self-perception because if you don't think that you can be healthy, if you don't think you can succeed on this plan, if you do not fundamentally like who you are as a person because of how you have felt after all of these failed diets. Those feelings are not going to go away, even if you do lose some weight. And what's going to happen is you're going to experience some short-term success, but you're going to have more frustration because the changes you desire are occurring. But the changes that you really desire, which is how you feel about yourself and your life and the life you want to live, don't. And that is a dark, scary, frustrating place to be. And I say that we have to start, the way to get rid of that is understand that what it means to be healthy is not what like is, you know, painted in, in pictures for people to see, right? It's not what you're going to see on social media. Caring about your health is the same thing as being a healthy person. And we can't conflate, we can't confuse what it means to care about your health and figure out what works for you, right? So someone who changes their self-perception can say, I am a healthy person. I just haven't figured out what works for me. The mere fact that someone picks up a book or tries to shop better or does their best to exercise or go for a walk are indications, right? Evidence is confidence. It is evidence that you care because someone who doesn't care doesn't even put in any effort at all. But when we don't see success, we turn that inwards and we blame ourselves. And that type of shame and guilt and punishment becomes the foundation upon which we look at ourselves when we look at ourselves in the mirror. We don't see a number. We see someone who is a failure. We see someone who cannot do this. We see someone who is not healthy, as opposed to someone who just really wants to make a change and is struggling. And that vulnerability, that self-compassion, and that positive self-perception 
knowing that a good self-perception does not mean you are a finished product, right? We are, we are all works in progress. And if you can understand that a work in progress sometimes is at the very beginning and looks like someone who struggles, we can change the way that we see ourselves. We can give ourselves more patience. And with that combination of a little more positivity, a little more patience, it allows us to have the foundation to make behavioral change, which is what we're really looking to accomplish. I love that. I, I really love that. And it's and I can't cannot stress enough how much I support that because it's you know, I always say to people, messy mind, messy brain, messy body, messy life, whatever that looks like. And we it's okay to be a mess, but you have to manage that mess. And right. you know, that's the that's what we're sort of talking about here when it comes to diet and, and exercise and, and eating plans. The whole self-perception is absolutely critical. You know, I don't think people, I'm sure you're familiar with the research, but I'm not sure, not many people are familiar with the research on the fact that if you eating that, you've got that diet plan in place or whatever, you're trying to, you know, everything that you've just described. If your mind, if you're feeling shame and guilt and frustration and this never works for me and another one I'm going to try and I've got to achieve and comparing to everyone else and I couldn't get those five steps, what's wrong with me? All that mind stuff, that mind stuff is changing how the brain functions because the mind puts that into the brain and that influences how we function. Now that affects the mind and the brain right down to the level of the DNA and what the research has shown is that you can be doing that workout and eating that eating plan or that, that food that's, that's good and nutritious but you can lose up to between 80 and 96% of the benefit of that food just because your mind hasn't been managed. There's still shame, guilt. I don't know if I'm going to do this. I don't know if I can reach all the stuff that you were talking about. So, you know, self-perception, I totally agree. When it comes to eating, we have to look at our self-perception first. And that is not emphasized sufficiently. You know, the whole human experience, why a person has got that negative self-perception, why they were dieting in the first place, you know, all those issues, they don't get addressed sufficiently. And I see that is something that you, you like to, you know, you address in your book as well as really getting to grips with that. So I love that. So thank you. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating, right? And because we're like, well, why do we feel this way? And the reason is a lot of this stuff is planted because the wellness industry is one that is designed for good, but has been used for evil. And I don't mind saying that doesn't mean everyone is, but I do a lot. I understand the world of marketing very well. And great marketers know that two emotions will drive action more than anything. And that is fear and greed. And the wellness industry manipulates this to make you greedy for results and fearful of what will happen if you do not do these things because health is so implicitly important to all of us. You don't have to sell better health, health mm -mm. right? But if you manipulate it so that you can make someone feel bad about themselves, believe that they are unworthy, believe that they are unmotivated, that's a difficult place to be because if someone tells you that you don't care about your health unless you do X behavior or buy Y supplement, that is a very difficult place to be unless you recognize that, as I call them trap doors, that it's a trap door, right? This is a sales tactic. This is someone trying to manipulate you. It's no different than an abusive relationship. And the wellness industry has an abusive relationship with the people that it is supposed to be helping because we are planting the seeds to make people uncomfortable because you are correct. The shame and guilt that people have, and I talk about this in the book, is you know oftentimes you look at like, well, what's the best diet? Should I drop carbs? Should I drop fat? And more and more researchers are starting to ask themselves, well, when you go on this diet, how do you feel? about yourself. Do you have shame? Do you have guilt? Do you have anxiety? And the people who answer this eat significantly more, gain more weight. And it's not just a behavioral shift. You see it at the hormonal level. The people who have more stress and, and guilt have more cortisol. More cortisol is, is assigned with having changes in the hormones that control how much you want to eat. More cortisol disrupts your sleep. When your sleep is more disrupted, it causes changes in your brain that makes you desire more of the foods that you want to avoid, and it makes it harder for you to feel fuller. So you see this domino effect and layered on top of it, when you try to offset this stressful environment, you go on plans that tell you you can never eat whatever food you want to insert here, right? There's so many different diets that villainize individual foods. But it's interesting there was a study in the journal Appetite that took people and said, we do not want you to eat this one food for a day. And what happens? 
they ate 133% more calories because that stress and that guilt and the idea of, I can't have this. We want what we can't have. And when we think that we cannot go our life without having this thing that we want, we kind of just wave the white flag. We wave the white flag and we say, I can't, I can't do this. And it doesn't have to be that way. So part of it is like a lot of people listening might be like, well, how, what do I do with this stress and this guilt? How do I offset it? And it starts by recognizing that this doesn't live in you by accident. We're not born this way. You're being told to feel this way about yourself so that you buy another plan. And you got to put up the walls and just say, no, no, no. Like, where did these ideas even come from? And that doesn't mean that, and I love what you've just said, Adam, it's so good and so freeing. And it's it's like giving permission, like I always say, giving permission to, you know, to be a mess, but, it, you know, manage the mess. It's, you know, like you can't screw this up. Actually, it's okay to screw it up. You know, you can fix it up by getting away from all these these rigid rules that the that the wellness industry has created. I'm and there's so much so good glad. within that. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought this up because that's probably the most important thing. People are like, well, why the, why the title, right? So you, uh, I explained why I came up with it, right? Where it came from. But there are two things. One, know this. The, the study of behavioral change is based on a very, very simple premise, which is make it so easy, it's hard to fail. A lot of people, when they set their goals, they think that they have this big audacious goal. And that's fine. That's to me, is like a vision. But change is about levels of mastery. And you want to make it so easy that it's hard to fail. But when it comes to diet and nutrition, we don't act like that, right? And in other areas, it'd be easy to see. If we're teaching someone to swim, we don't throw them in the deep end, right? We start them in the shallow water. We put the toe in the water and realize that the water is safe and calm. We teach them how to tread. We teach them how to swim. And then we go in the deep end. In dieting, we throw people in the deep end. We cut their arm and we throw them in with sharks. And we wonder why they fail. We need to gradually progress people. Give people the tools to be comfortable, to be confident. Make it so easy that it's hard to fail, that when you do these little things, patterns of reinforcement are clear. We've known this in human psychology forever. Success breeds success. It is a success to wake up and have some gratitude. It is a success if you eat one vegetable a day and you didn't have a vegetable before, that is a win. And if you can repeat that for just once, that is another win. And you need to stack these wins to the point that they become automatic. So they do become habits, but you can't give people 10 habits to do at the same time. And those 10 habits shouldn't feel like you're carrying the weight of the world on your back. The habit should feel like it is adding to your life. And what I try to teach people in this book is how to systematically and simply add these. So part of you can't screw this up is stop making the plan so hard. You can go fast by starting slow right? Because then you build confidence, then you build comfort, you expand that comfort zone so that you are in a zone where it is easier for you to take things on when you are ready. We have to meet people where they are, stop throwing people in a scenario where they're fundamentally uncomfortable. And the other point is diets break you because they teach you that these screw-ups are these huge mistakes. And the funny thing is, is those screw-ups are not mistakes at all, Right? The idea that you can't have dessert, the idea that you won't cook every single meal or you won't eat takeout or you might miss a workout, right? We act like we have these frail bodies. We are incredibly resilient, powerful, Mm -hmm. human beings. If I were to tell someone, work out only one time a month, what would you say your your shape is going to be? They're probably like, well, I'm not going to be that fit. So why is it if someone has one meal, two meal, three bad meals in a week or a month, do we act like suddenly our body's all going to fall apart? Exactly. It it won't. So we are taught to react and overreact to these screw-ups when in fact those are not screw-ups at all. Those are mere bumps in the road on the journey of life that your body can withstand. The screw up is doing what the wellness industry wants you to do, which is to overreact. And and also just in terms of that overreaction, Adam, is that what what do they do? Because there is a shift, but there's been for years, there's been this, because I've written books about food and stuff as well. And the one I wrote was in 2014 or 15. And even at that stage, I was saying at that point, I was saying things like, there's so many different options. What do you choose? It's so confusing. People were so confused. So it's been years 
of people being very, very confused and overwhelmed by pretty, you know, if you take each, each diet book or each exercise book or each wellness product, everything's got something good. The problem I think what you and I are both saying here is that it's to say that this is the way. And if you don't right. do this and you fail, well, there's something wrong with you. And, and that's what the neuropsychiatric industry does and the biomedical model in terms of mental health. And, you know, it all kind of blends together. So what we what you try what I see is a shift and, and I'm and I'm and I'm so glad you've captured this shift, but I'm seeing a shift from the people that I interview away from this is the only way to hey, let's have a more, you know, more realistic approach. Let's understand the power of the mind and the influence of the mind over the body and and let's be free and recognize bio-individuality because what works for one is you can't say that this is the only way of eating. You can't say that that's a bad food because for someone else it's not. I mean, I cannot touch right. nuts. I cannot touch garlic. I cannot touch onions and I cannot touch mushrooms. I love them. They're excellent foods. If I eat them, I get sick. You know, right. so it, when you tell, you got to eat nuts, you got to do it. It's, it's the bio-individuality. So let's talk about something that I know you've mentioned a few times and I know it's caught people's attention and that is takeout because that's been the, you know, this is the demon of dieting. <laughs> this right. is takeout or eating in a restaurant. And you actually have a chapter in your book about, you know, how to do the eat takeout thing. And, yeah. you know, so t talk about that. Talk about, and you started mentioning it now that how can one, we're not so fragile, our mind nor our body, we're actually incredibly resilient. But if you tell someone that your body's fragile and your mind's fragile, you, you mask the resilience that's naturally there. Whereas if we say, hey, one or two, this or whatever, we start unmasking our resilience. So talk right. a little bit about how to unmask our resilience and increase our resilience and, un, and get out of this fragility zone when it comes to takeout. Yeah, and I think it helps knowing what you just said. There is no one size fits all diet plan. And it's not just you knowing what foods work for you or me knowing what foods work for me. It's very strongly scientifically based. At this point, you know, the research has looked and compared all the different diets. There's a very famous study that was done in New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most famous journals, where they legitimately took all the different popular diets like a low carb based, a low fat based, a vegan based, a Weight Watchers type plan, a zone, very balanced diet between like carbs, Keto. proteins, and fats. And what they found in a very anticlimactic way is that none of them were better than the other. What guaranteed the results and the long lasting results was what people could sustain for the longest period of time. So the question isn't what food you need to remove or what dietary tribe you need to ascribe to. You can pick any of them. I don't tell people like what style of diet to eat. I try and provide tools that make it easier for them to sustain because that is what matters. And one of those tools is we're constantly fighting our food environment. And I will be the first to admit our food environment is not created in a way that makes it easier for us to be healthier right? Foods are now engineered, the ultra processed foods. This is not saying all processed foods because there are a lot of very healthy foods that are processed and convenient and that people can eat. Ultra processed foods, which means foods that fundamentally have added amounts of salt, sugar, fat, make us want to eat more food almost in an uncontrollable, uncontrollable way. So we need to learn how to limit those. But takeout is a part of life simply because we are busy, we enjoy food. It's a social aspect of life. And being social and interacting with friends is one of the so healthiest important. things that we can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is so, so important. So the idea that we need to remove something that fundamentally helps us build community and prevents us from being isolated and is a shared experience and something that people enjoy isn't healthy at all. I don't see how anyone can say, hey, you enjoy this thing. This is good for you. You're around other people. You shouldn't do it. And you're like, well, food shouldn't be about celebration. It says who? It says who, right? That is a, a fundamental judgment on a way that we all live, not to mention the healthiest cultures in the world, the people who live the longest, the blue zones, they eat community meals and go out and do it all the all time. All the time. All the time. It is a fundamental part of the fabric of life that helps them live so long. So yes, our food environment is anchored against us, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't eat takeout. We just either have to be 
a more aware of what to eat and doesn't mean you're only eating only eating salads i teach people how to essentially order out from any restaurant and even took the top 50 restaurants in the yeah US. it's so interesting the, the fast food places and teach people how to navigate a menu but there are also little things that people can do that doesn't take away from the enjoyment of eating but does take away from the things that restaurants will do that makes them so dangerous and the the biggest one is that like which people don't even like think about necessarily but we talk about adding unnatural amounts of salt and sugar and fat to meals this typically happens in takeout meals but you can very easily request to either like put all the sauces and oils on the side or the thing that i found which i did an experiment with is like if you write especially a popular asian cuisines and things like that to use a quarter of the oil right a quarter of the oil is it's an arbitrary amount, but it makes it very clear that you just want a fraction of the amount of oil. And I did this for the people who did the follow the test plan where you would get it. And aesthetically, the dishes look very, very different. But taste wise, when we did blind taste test, you can't taste the difference because all of these oils, all they're doing is making it hyper palatable and it's giving you just tons of additional calories that you don't need. It actually doesn't enhance the flavor anymore. So there's all these little tips that I try to include where it's no inconvenience for you. I'm not telling you not to get the foods that you don't enjoy. I'm telling you to just make a request to the chef. And it doesn't matter if you're using an app, ordering takeout or in the restaurant that fundamentally will leave the enjoyment of the food just the same. And the only thing that will really change is the appearance of it. And I think our job is to enable people and say anywhere between like one to three times per week, you can enjoy takeout and you choose what works for you. And the, the, the there's like, well, what the, what's the math behind this? Well, the math is both on the scientific side of studies that show when people do not completely restrict the foods that they like, their compliance goes way up, their happiness goes way up, their mindfulness of enjoying foods goes way up and then their cravings go down because here's the thing we're constantly in this gate at this guilt and shame cycle that would even when we go out and enjoy these foods whether it's takeout or whether it's dessert we don't truly enjoy it because we can't be in the moments then we still crave it as opposed to knowing that this is part of the plan so when you change your mindset again the self-perception and the perception of what you are allowed to do it changes your enjoyment and then it has a positive domino effect of the guilt and shame that you typically carry and more importantly just look at it from a math perspective the average person eats three meals per day there are seven days in a week let's say you have 21 meals in a day some people have snacks as well if you have two to three meals where you go out and you just eat and enjoy. And this doesn't mean that you eat whatever you want. You eat what it is that you are craving and you enjoy it. That still means that 90% of your meals are compliant. There is not a single area in life where when you are 90% good at something, you will not have 110% results, right? And in, in life, we're usually operating more around 50 to 60%. This isn't school where you need to get 90 or above to get an A. You know, we our behaviors are done on a most of the time basis, not all of the time. And I think it's so important to not only change your mindset about food, but allow yourself to enjoy it and be present because a big part of not craving it anymore is being able to be mindful and grateful and appreciate it and know that you're not doing anything wrong. Because if you do, you then start that I screwed it up cycle where we're trying to compensate. We fast the next day, we detox, we exercise twice as hard. And these are all punishments. And we carry these punishments. The goal is to stop punishing ourselves for completely normal, healthy behaviors and realize that after we eat this way, after we do this, the best thing to do is just go back to your normal behavior. There is no compensatory reaction. There is no need to fast. There is no need to do anything extreme. That's what actually sends you down the blind path. So have takeout a few times a week. Use the guidelines. Cut the amount of oils. That's like the simplest one because that's fat is more than twice as calorically dense as carbohydrates or protein. 
So it just means for every single one gram of protein, it's four calories. For a gram of fat, it's nine. It doesn't mean that fat is bad or all fats are bad. It just means that if someone puts a lot of fat into a meal, it makes it way more caloric and it makes it more likely that you're going to eat more of it. So if you can just make a request to the kitchen while still keeping the enjoyment in the food, you can eat out, you can take out and go on with your life feeling like, wow, this is this is part of the plan. Love it. Our mind drives our brain, drives our body, drives how we turn it, how we, how we act, how our behaviors change, how we show up. And this is so vital. So it's, it's actually a mind-driven process, which is what it should be. I love that. Right. Where can people get hold of the book? Where can people get hold of you? Yeah. So you can, the book is out right now. The book is out today, actually. It's launched today. Congratulations. That's Thank wonderful. You. So you can just go to can't screw this up.com. The book is you can't screw this up. The URL is can't screw this up.com. And then you can find me anywhere on social media at born fitness. Fantastic. Well, thank you for your time and your wisdom. And I think this book is going to set a lot of people free with them realizing that if my mind is so torn up around dieting, my body can't function like it should. And it'll probably hold on to what we don't want and release what we do want kind of thing. So getting your mind into the game will help you not screw it up. So Adam, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.